Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at a throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face. Heal my wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Have I on earth beside thee, whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. As you're turning to Genesis 18, let me read for you from Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. And so here God has permitted that finally the foundation of eternal judgment would be preached. <clears throat> I've sat on the finishing this series for several weeks now and now it just seemed appropriate, and uh, I seem to have a sense of um, urgency about the message anyways. Let's see how the Lord works with us as we learn of the foundation of eternal judgment. <clears throat> I had you turn to Genesis chapter 18. Look with me in verse 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous... I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the answer to that question is, of course, yes. 
The judge of all the earth shall do right. Here the discussion between Abraham and the Lord is back and forth about God deciding to slay the city of Sodom for the cry that has gone up from those that are hurt and harmed as a result of the wickedness that was present in that city. The cry went up and God says, I will go down that I may know whether it be according to what I have heard. And so Abraham says, if there's 50 righteous there within that wicked city, will you not spare the place for them? Will you have the righteous be as the wicked? Will you destroy them along with them? Is that your judgment? He says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the answer, of course, is yes, he will do right. But the thing is, is that right isn't always what we would do. <laughs> right isn't always right in our perspective. We th see things differently than God. What we do is not often right. What we perceive as right and expect of God to do as right isn't always right. God knows better. God is plain here in his dealings with Abraham. Let's continue down in verse 32. And he says, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. Hear Abraham talking. And I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Now we as carnal men are capable of judgment, certainly. And we're encouraged to judge. The truth is, is that you can't merge onto an interstate without judgment. You can't map out a direction from point A to point B on a bus route without judgment. You can't even make a purchase from the store without judgment. These people are insane when they think to themselves, judge not, judge not, I don't judge anything. <laughs> judgment is the ability to make considered decisions or come to sensible conclusions. Sometimes when people say, judge not, judge not, I don't judge anything, I look at them and go, you, you may be right. You don't make sensible decisions. You don't mm -hmm. consider anything and then decide based on that. There's, there's something missing up here, these people that are like, judge not, judge not. I don't, I don't judge anything. You can't even get out of your bed and get to your workplace without making judgments. It's just a decision, right and wrong, left or right. The sensible one. This world would be in chaos without judgment. <laughs> Everything falls apart. Now, regarding judgment, we have temporal judgment. We have eternal judgment. Of course, we're going to lean on eternal judgment and figure out what that means. But in the temporal, from our perspective, we have right or wrong. Like I said, we have left or right. We have up or down. We're deciding between this or that. And we're making calculated decisions about what we should purchase, about what we should use, about where we should go, about how we should act. Now I would say that right and wrong become very blurred when we're left to our own devices to decide what the standard is, certainly, right? I just had a conversation outside with a man that said he's going to balance out his right versus wrong, and yet he deems what's going on in the basement here is right, while saying I'm wrong for preaching Christ unto him. It's skewed. It's mixed up. But he's got the wrong standard. Our right in the temporal plane needs to be done according to the eternal judgment, and that's of God. The judge of all the earth shall do right, and, and we need to set that to our seal and know that God will always do right in his judgments. God is doing right all the time in his judgments, so to do right is to do as the judge would do. And follow him. The problem is, though, that we're not the judge, are we? We're certainly not God. We're certainly not capable of even thinking like God. We don't make decisions like God. We don't act like God. We're far from it, in fact. Turn to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. <clears throat> Your Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, one of the big major prophets, the first of them. <clears throat> In short, if we're to do right, if we're to have proper and good judgment, we need to let him make the judgment call. We need to let him, God Almighty, the judge of all the earth, do the thinking for us. Ideal world, that's how we would walk, talk, act, and behave is according to his will all the time. 
forsaking my own judgment and my own thinking, as it says in Isaiah chapter 55. Look at verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. While God may be found, while he is near unto you, while he has an ear attentive to you, that's when you ought to seek and find him, call upon him. Verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, talking about his own way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We're to seek God. We're to find God. We're to call upon God while he is near, present, and able to be found. Let the wicked forsake his way. And I'm telling you, if you're walking in your own way and your own judgments, you're wicked. You're going to fall into the condemnation of doing wickedly because your thoughts and your ways will always tend to wrong, will always tend to sin. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I had not known sin but by the law and by God revealing it to me. And so if I'm to follow my own way, it's always going to lead to devastation. It's always going to lead to destruction. And so here in verse 7, he says, let the wicked forsake his way. Let Josh Gander forsake his own way and his own decisions. Let the unrighteous man, and there are none righteous, no, not one. So don't go stamping yourself and saying you need not repentance. I'm righteous. No, the unrighteous man that's teaching every one of us, we ought to forsake our thoughts. Our thoughts need to be brought into the captivity of Christ. In other words, take my thoughts, remove them, and, and have God be in control of that every whim and every thought and every thinking way. Forsake your way, because it's always wicked. Our ways are always self-motivated. Our, always, our ways are always self-serving. Our ways are always self-righteousness. Unfortunately, that's just the state of man. You were born that way. Forsake your thoughts. Here he says, return unto God. Forsake your thoughts. And the second part of verse 7 says, And let him return unto the Lord. Return unto the Lord. Return unto the Lord. That means turn and then turn again. And that's returning unto God. In other words, every single time you begin to have your own thoughts and follow your own way, return unto God. Return unto God. Return unto God. This is, this is something that will constantly happen. This is why I've been enjoying getting up and praying to God first thing. Because otherwise, I get up and it's my thoughts, my ways, my doing. So I need to get up and return unto God. Return unto God. Forsaking my way. Forsaking my thoughts. Put away the YouTube. Put away the, the, the newspaper. And look at, first and foremost, seeking unto God returning unto the Lord. Why? Because he will have mercy upon him and to our God, return unto our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You're not going to get mercy or pardon any way, in any place, but from God Almighty. And he is the judge. So that's where we need to go for it. Continue on in verse 8. For my thoughts, here's God proclaiming about himself, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. In other words, you don't think like me, nor do you do after me. Nor do you do like me. You don't behave like me. You don't think like me. My thoughts are nothing compared to your thoughts. They're different. They're polar opposites. And your ways are not my ways, saith the Lord. How different and polarizing are they? Look at verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the heavens above, and we've only beheld, I believe, the first and second of the heavens. And those are pretty high. The third heaven beyond that. It's incomprehensible how much higher God's ways are than our own ways. It's incomprehensible how much higher God's thoughts are than my own thoughts. Our judgments, our thoughts, our beliefs, our decisions are base, menial, crude, and inferior to God's in every single way. Eternal judgment compared to the temporal judgment that I have is high. Indeed, it's most high. It's the most high eternal judgment is. And it's found in his eternal word. Verse 10. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. As the provision of rain comes down, and provides for those that are sowing and eating, those that are reaping, and those are receiving the reward, and those that place it down and plant it. 
The provision of God cometh by way of the rain, he says. As that happens, verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. His word is always right. His word is always just. His word always achieves its intended result. His word is always on point. It never deviates. It always hits the mark. It's always bullseye when he sends it forward. It comes out of his mouth. It doesn't return void. It doesn't fall short. It does exactly what he pleases, and it prospers in the thing that he sent it to do. That's the word of God. That's the judgment of God. High, potent, and final is the eternal judgment of the Most High God. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 9. Psalm chapter 9. His judgments are so right, just, true, pure. They even quantify him. Look at this. They qualify him. He's known by them. Verse 7 of Psalm chapter 9. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. His throne is prepared. It's set. It's furnished. It's ready for judgment. That's why he's sitting there. Verse 8, it says, And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgments to the people in, un, in, in uprightness. The judge of all the earth shall do right. And here he sets his, sits on his throne prepared unto judgment. To judge the world in righteousness, he ministers, he serves, he gives of himself in righteous judgment. That's how he serves the people in the uprightness of who he is. He's known by his judgment. Verse 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Hegeon Salah. Praise the Lord. Pause and think on that. The Lord is known by the judgments which he executeth. Have you ever read a psalm or a proverb to somebody, an unbeliever, and they're like, wow. That is true. That's right. That's just. There's people that, that, that worship the Psalms and the Proverbs, but they won't turn to God because of the wisdom that's found in those writings that God inspired Solomon and King David to pen down. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of their own hands. And that's the problem. They're full of works of their own hands. <clears throat> their own thoughts to them are on par. Their own works, their own deeds are on par with what God would execute. How wrong could they be? Psalm chapter 10, look at verse 4. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. And so here's another proclamation of that same truth we just read in Isaiah. So high above are the judgments of out of sight of these wicked, out of sight of the proud, out of sight of those that will not seek after God, that have removed God from every one of their thoughts. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Imagine the foolishness of one that knows God but won't put him into their own thoughts. Will not regard him, will not follow him, will not seek after him. His ways are always grievous. God's grieved at the ways of the wicked and those that will not fill themselves with the thoughts and judgments of God. This is a big problem. Imagine the person trying to have their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds when God is just looking at his ways and just grieved by them every moment. Imagine, imagine the affront to God and when they will stand before God as judgment is appointed to men once to die, or it's pointed under when once to die and after this the judgment, even though as that takes place, the person that says, I have done, I have worked, I have wrought, and God says, all of those things to me, the pride, pride that you showed in your countenance, how you didn't seek after me, how you walked your ways before me, God says it's a stench in his nostrils. Continuing on in Psalm chapter 18. 
David talks about his great prosperity in Psalm chapter 18, verse 20. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. Okay, now it seems as if David here is talking about his ways and his works and his doings. It would if you'd left out verse 21, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. He's seeking after the Lord. He's seeking after the ways of the Lord. And in doing so, that's how he gains righteousness. That's how his hands stay clean. And God recompenses reward to him as a result. Why? Because he followed the Lord. Followed the Lord's ways and followed the Lord's righteous judgments as he walked. And as he worked and as he served. Verse 22 says, For all his judgments were before me. He's keeping the ways of the Lord. He's not departing from his God. All his judgments are before him. And I did not put away his statutes from me. They're before me, day and night. I'm looking to them. I'm, I'm having them in front of me as frontlets between my eyes. I'm seeking after the judgments of God is what David here is saying. He's, not kept, he's, he's kept his ways, not departed from them. The judgments and statutes are before them. Therefore, he was upright and kept from all iniquity. And there is the power. I was also upright before him, verse 23, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of mine hands in his eyesight. David here just sandwiched his, his own righteousness he's talking about. My righteousness and my cleanness of mine hands, how did it come? Not because David was willing it, but because David had God's word before him. David had God's judgments before him. David followed after God and sought the Lord in all these things. That's how he was upright, and that's how he was kept from iniquity in the sight of God, and therefore he was rewarded as a result. Verse 30 in that same psalm, it says this, for As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. God's way is perfect. God's way is complete here, he's saying. The word of the Lord is tried. It'll never let you down. It's been tried, tested, and proven true by men like David and those that preceded him. Men have followed in the will of God, and as a result, they have received the recompense of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and it's been seen in their lives by the blessings. By the, by the power that God gave unto them. By, by how God used them greatly and mightily in his kingdom. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to those that trust in him. We need a buckler today. We need a, we need a, a protection upon us. It's like a shield, that buckler you hide behind. You trust in God. Follow his word. Keep his way. He will protect you in these last days. Psalm chapter 19 talks more about the judgments of God. Verse 7, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. From the position of understanding the power of his law to convert the soul, the testimony to make wise the simple, the statutes of the Lord to rejoice the heart and give you joy and strength, the commandments of God that enlighten your eyes and open them up to see the truth, the fear of the Lord that is clean and endures forever and will carry you through those judgments of God that are true and righteous altogether, all these things that are more to be desired than gold, fine gold, and all the riches that this world has to offer. 
From that standpoint, you can be cleansed of your secret faults. You can be kept back from presumptuous sins. You can be held in the way of the Lord, but it starts with His eternal judgments. It starts with the Word of God. It starts with His commands and His laws and His statutes toward Him. It starts with fearing Him above all things. You can go to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy 25. As you do, let me read for you. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. That's Psalm 119. Deuteronomy 25. How do you cleanse your way? How does your way line up with the way of God? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. This is what David came to realize. I'm a young man. Certainly younger than I will be tomorrow anyways. (laughs) Wherewithal shall I cleanse my way? By heeding to the word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 25. <clears throat> Again, the, word is miss- the world is missing that, that, that true judgment. The, 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 basically the litmus test. What is true? What is right? Like I talked about how if every man does what's right in their own eyes, it's chaos. If there's no judgment, if there's no standard for judgment, we're a mess. We're going to fall apart. What is right? What is wrong? What is up? What is down? There needs to be a standard. It's the Word of God. Deuteronomy 25. Look with me in verse 13. Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have perfect and just weight. A perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. He's talking here about having weights for measuring things. Okay, so whenever you measured, they don't have it much anymore because now you have the automatic scanners. I don't know if you remember in the grocery stores, there used to be the balance that was weighing. And you would balance this much with that much in order to measure out how much wheat or how much barley or how much flour you were getting and you would you would use a 100 gram here and then put a thing there and if it balances you have 100 grams total he's talking here about not having diverse weights a great and a small varying weights in other words i'm going to give you a good deal so i'm going to put down a smaller weight or a bigger weight depending on how i want to either benefit you or not benefit you god here is telling his people that they need just Weights. In other words, if it says a hundred, it's a hundred. If it says thou shalt, then thou shalt. If it says thou shalt not, then thou shalt not. Judgment needs to be sure and perfect and right and not deviate. He says thou shalt have a perfect weight and a just weight, a perfect measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened. Verse 16, for all that do such things, in other words, their weights are changeable. Their weights vary. Their decisions change day to day, moment to moment. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. By practical extension, if you don't have a proper judgment, a proper truth, a, if you don't have a, a, an authority to refer to, then you're just like the one with the unjust measure. You're going to decide today whether that's right or that's wrong. You're going to choose in this moment whether you should do good or do evil. You're going to call evil good and good evil at times. You're going to day to day, moment to moment, change your mind about things. And as a result, you'll be doing unrighteously. If you do so, you're an abomination unto the Lord thy God. He wants nothing to do with it. And so as a Christian, we ought to then go to that perfect and just measure, and we ought to look to that as our final authority. If God says this, then that's the truth, and that's the standard. We don't soften the standard by making it a little bit less. We don't harden the standard by making it a little bit more, and we can be guilty of both things. Well, did God really mean thou shalt not? Maybe there's certain scenarios where you can get away with that. No, you've softened the standard. You've lessened the weight. Or God said thou shalt not, but I'm going to add to it this in order to make sure that we don't deviate from, right? Now you're hardening the standard. You're making it greater than what it was intended to do. 
God's weights are perfect. God's judgments are perfect. His eternal judgment is exactly where it needs to be. And that's what we need to follow after. A perfect and a just measure. In judgment, it's the word of God. To measure yourself You go to the word of God. Then you can use that same word of God in order to measure others, in order to measure surroundings, in order to measure situations. But you need to always appeal back to the standard. No more, no less. God's word is always the standard as it is written. Remember in Malachi's day, in the New Testament, or right before the New Testament, you don't need to go there. I'll just just, um, kind of speak to what he was talking about in the second chapter there. In Malachi's day, the people had wearied the Lord God. He said, you have wearied me, he spoke to the people. He said, you have wearied me with your words. And yet the response of the people is, wherein have we wearied thee, Lord? And his response is, ye weary me when ye say, where is the God of judgment? When you look to the God of judgment and you ask, well, where is he? Is God here? Is he listening? Is he, is he judging? Is he, you, you, these people in Malachi's day didn't have a just measure because they said, where is he? Where is God? So they were left to their own devices doing what was right in their own mind and therefore trusting in themselves. When you say, where is the God of judgment? You're wearying him. Here he is. Is the quick and final answer. Right here contained in the scriptures. Here is the word of God. You can judge yourself by it. You can can allow the judge of all the earth to judge you according to it. By the eternal weight and the eternal measure, the eternal word of God, you can finally look to where you ought to be and know where you're at and judge accordingly. He's always going to do right. You want to do right, you do after what God told you to do. The Bible says, judge not according to the appearance of but judge righteous judgment. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. In other words, don't use your senses and what you see and what you perceive to make a judgment call. Judge righteous judgment means look to that just weight, that eternal weight, that eternal standard, that eternal judgment, and that is your final judgment that you need to make, as God would. These words aren't incomplete. There's nothing missing, nothing lacking here. God says they're perfect. God says they're pure. God says they're right. God says they're true. All together. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Judge not, and we can't just leave it there, because there's a comma, that ye be not judged, is how that sentence finishes. Judge not that ye be not judged. If you want to have God's judgment and correction and rebuke withheld from your life, then just withhold some judgment from throwing it out there. Judge not that ye be not judged. But if you judge according to God's word, then you're not judging, are you? He is. And that's eternal judgment. This is what we need to get away from. Our tendency is to temporally what we see judge scenarios and judge situations judge not that ye be not judged so judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment the only righteous judgment we have in the whole of the universe is contained here in the scriptures use his word as the judge as the authority as the litmus test as the scale as the final weight that perfect weight and measure, that's where you go to and let him do the judgment and you are not judging and therefore you will not be judged. Now, here's where the problem does tend to happen. In verse 2 it says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. In other words, if I'm using my own judgment to judge others and to, and to lay out um, what I think is the truth in a certain scenario, I'm going to be judged in the same way. If I'm judging with that heavy measure... You know, I'm taking the command of God that says, thou shalt not steal. And now I'm like, if you even think about stealing, then you're guilty of that. And I've put more to that weight. And I will be judged in the same way when I go and have that thought of myself. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. In other words, if you want to be safe from the judgment of God turning around upon you, then judge not. Let him do the judgment. That's what we need to have more of, the eternal judgment in our lives. 
Every situation ought to have a scripture that goes with it as far as how we're deciding and outlining our days and our lives and our decisions. We ought to be able to go to a scripture and say and think to ourselves, okay, what would God do in this scenario? What's his judgment in this scenario? And as a result, you don't judge and you won't be judged. Verse 3, though, says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? And this is the foolish thing. I go to my brother, Tristan, here, and I got a beam hanging out of my eye. And I say, hey, brother, hey, brother, you got a, you got a big, you got a little speck of wood in your eye there. Hey, hey, you got to get that thing out of your eye. That looks really uncomfortable. It's very bad for you. You are, you, there is something wrong with your eyeball, brother. You need to get that thing fixed. Look at that piece of wood there. I can see it from here, right? Look pretty foolish when I got a beam in my own eye, right? But that's what hypocrisy looks like in the eyes of God. When I'm judging a brother with a measure that I have determined, when I'm judging my brother with a judgment that I have determined, and I'm ignoring the fact that I'm judged of the same, right? It's like that guy going to his brother trying to get the speck out of his eye when he's got a beam hanging out of his own eye. That's hypocrisy. And so what do we do? We look to the judgment of God, make sure we're right first, right? Because that's where the, that's the, the first application of the scriptures ought to be on me first. That in, in me first, God might show forth his mercy. In me first, God might do the correcting, the rebuke, the chastening. God might do the washing and the cleaning that I may help others as a result. Instead of being a hypocrite, beholding the mote that is in thy brother's eye, the little speck in his eye, not considering the beam hanging out of my own eye. Look at verse 4. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye. Everyone's going to be like, how are you going to pull out this little speck when there's a baseball bat hanging out of your face? What in the world? How are you going to judge your brother for not doing such and such, like you would appear, would be righteous? How are you going to judge your brother for... For lying when, when you're full of lies. How are you going to judge your brother for, for thinking wrong thoughts when that's all you do? <clears throat> Thou hypocrite, verse 5, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat that is in thine brother's eye. Make sure your own house is clean before you start judging someone else's. And I think that this is one of those verses that the more you look into it, the more you get that fear of God in your hearts, you know? If I'm attacking somebody and saying, hey, you got to stop lying about people, you're a railer, you're a wicked person, but I've done the same thing. When God's judgment falls on them for their sin and I see it from afar, I ought to be now thinking about, ooh, I've done that same thing. And, and, and be, be concerned about the fact that his judgment may turn upon me. Let God do the judging. Go to Romans chapter 11. He's capable. He's able. We got a whole word of God in front of us that's full of righteous judgments, righteous ways of living. It's the way of life. There's no substitution, Romans chapter 11, for the word of God. For the eternal judgment that he gives us. Don't, don't take the eternal judgment, his eternal decisions, his eternal judgments and commands, and compromise it with something that is of my, my own opinion, my own thoughts, my own determination, my own judgment. You're setting yourself up for failure. Romans chapter 11, look with me in verse 33. It says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Think about that. Why would you rely on your own understanding when you have at your disposal the word of God, which is full of the depths of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God? <laughs> How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out? You can spend your whole life searching through his judgments and his words and trying to seek after his wisdom and knowledge and the best you can come up with is Solomon's end where he said vanity of vanities all is vanity 
Verse 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Who sat down with the Lord and said, you know what, I think you ought to do this in this situation. And had God yield to him. Who's known the mind of the Lord, fully comprehended the, the thoughts of God Almighty? you got to understand that his judgments are unsearchable, infinitely higher than our ways. Even more so than that description of the heaven of heaven of heavens being higher than us. I think it's bigger than that. The gap between my thoughts and his thoughts. The gap between my ways and his ways. And the more we learn of his ways and seek after his word and, and, and embrace and follow after his judgments, I believe the more we'll realize that, that we've fallen short of the glory of God. Humility ought to come upon us. Verse 35, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. In other words, does God need my provision in order for him to give? Does he need of what I have in order for it to be returned unto me? God spoke the universe and all that in them is into existence. He needs nothing. He has no need of anything that I have to offer him. But what a glorious and wonderful thing that he would reveal his truth to me, that he would seek to save me, that he would indeed save me and he would desire to have a relationship with me when he needs nothing from me. Verse 36, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. He needs nothing. Again, that reiterates it. All things for are of him and through him and to him. He gets all the glory for that. Amen. A few pages to the right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I just want to highlight today the eternal judgment of God. Your base, menial, crude, inferior judgments. <laughs> Let's not lean on those. Let's lean on the eternal judgment judgment of God, the word of God, the word of truth here. And that's what God, I believe, was highlighting when he talked through the Apostle Paul over there in Hebrews chapter 6. He says these are foundational things, the foundation of baptisms, the foundation of, of the, um, <clears throat> the foundations of um, eternal judgment, the foundations of, these are all things that are foundational to the Christian they're not necessarily basic, but he left them aside for the moment to discuss other things. He said, the laying on doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying against the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, the doctrine of baptism, the laying on of hands, of resurrection from the dead, and of eternal judgment. And as we walked through these different topics in Hebrews chapter 6, we found that there was both a temporal truth and also a bigger spiritual truth. The temporal you can grasp. What is baptism in our plane? What is repentance from dead works and faith towards God? What is laying on of hands? What is the resurrection of the dead? What is eternal judgment? We can grab those in the temporal things, but these things are so foundational to the Christian life and so pivotal to living a right Christian life that they're far deeper than we could ever comprehend. And here we're talking about God's righteous judgments, and the Apostle Paul just gave credence to them when he said he just gave affirmation to just how wonderful they are when he said they're deep both in riches and wisdom and knowledge they're unsearchable they're past finding out all these things consist in him and he deserves the glory for all of them amen in first corinthians over there in chapter 2 in verse 12 the bible says now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So what we have received in receiving the engrafted word which is able to save our souls, what we have received through the trail of blood in which this book was recorded, kept, preserved from a temporal sense to come into our hands today, what we have received as a result of the preservation of the Holy Spirit of God is something that is not of this world. It's something that is so much bigger. The Spirit of God. And by it we might know the things that are freely given unto us of God. Infinitely deep is this book. It's the eternal word. It is the eternal 
judgment. It is the eternal word of God. Verse 13 says, Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Do you know what he's saying here? We judge not. <laughs> we let him judge. The words that I speak, even in judgment of you, even in truth and in righteousness, even as I try to rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine, we're not speaking the words that men's wisdom teaches, but the words which the Holy Ghost teaches. I'm not giving you my opinion and my thoughts and my deeds and presenting them to you as some good way, but that which is infinitely higher, the wisdom which the Spirit of God teacheth, that Holy Ghost, which is spiritual. Why? Because verse 14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the spiritual Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither indeed can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And that's the sad state when we try to come up with our own judgments. That's the sad state of us when we try to do things our way. They're foolishness, the things of God, unto us. We can't know them, the things of God, because they are spiritually discerned. Look at verse 15. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Why? Because he's judging not according to the appearance, but judging righteous judgment. Because he's judging not lest he be judged and allowing God, the eternal judge, to judge rightly. <laughs> Telling you, we can always look to him. Look to the word and making any kind of decision. All matters of faith and practice are found here. You will find it in command or principle. You will find the way that you ought to go. If you can't find it directly just in your Bible reading, just pray to God. Maybe he doesn't want you to make a judgment today. He wants you to put it off for a couple days, so he'll eventually show you through his word, but that's why it's here. The eternal judgment of God before us. Verse 6 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And indeed, here in the Word of God, we have Christ's mind. We have His thoughts. We have His desires. We have His intents for us. We have His judgments that we ought to follow. We have the truth before us. We have the way. We have the truth. We have the life. And through these words, we can know the mind of God and we can perform the mind of God. But only if these things are spiritually concerned and only if they're things which are led of the Spirit of God. It's what we ought to follow. And this is a foundation of our faith another one of them but it's not just a quick do yep i can achieve that step completed i'm on to next big and better things i think the apostle paul said in in his in his book there he's like these will we address if god permit was because he didn't want to make the book of hebrews into the entire word of god <laughs> which it is those portions that he's talking about these foundations of the christian life are so deep and so intense and so so incomprehensible that it takes a whole word of God to first place them down and have them available, but then it takes the Spirit of God to teach them unto us. And so again, this truth, while it is foundational, it's not simple. It'll take you a whole lifetime and you still won't even scratch the surface of what God wants to teach you through His eternal judgment and his eternal judgments that he has made and i'm certainly thankful that he's given me it and i'll never finish it and i'll always be something left to learn and grow in thank you father for your word i thank you for the scriptures that you've given to us i thank you